What's up everybody, it's Izzy, and the topic that I'm going to address in today's video is exercise variation. The main point that I wanna make is that exercise variation is not strictly necessary. Even though you see it in every single program for the most part, it's not strictly necessary. However, in the video what I want to explain is why you should be including exercise variations even if they're not strictly necessary. So to start off with here, what I want to explain a little bit more, give you some background on, is the concept of specificity and transference. So the principle of specific adaptations to impose demands the said principle basically dictates that you get better at what you repeatedly do. So if you want to get better at squatting, you should squat, not ride your bike. Now, everywhere in between doing squats and riding your bike is a, a continuum of potential exercises that will have varying degrees of transference to the exercise that you want to improve based on how specific it is. So the easiest way to understand this is that in powerlifting, the exercise variation that we are most concerned with is the one rep squat, the one rep bench press, and the one rep deadlift. Now, all of us know somebody either through the internet or in person who can bench press, say, 225 pounds, 100 kilos, so two plates, for 20 or 30 reps. In fact, in the NFL, the National Football League in the United States, they have prospects do an absurd test where they get as many reps as possible with 225 pounds. Now, many of these guys get 20, 25, 30 reps. And if you went and plugged those numbers in to a one rep max calculator, what it would tell you is that these guys should be capable of 500 plus pound bench presses. But we know that that is absolutely not the case. They cannot do that. And the reason for this is that even high enough reps where any reps besides one rep is an exercise variation. Now, a lot of people don't think of it that way. They think of, you know, an eight rep set of competition squats is the same exercise as a one rep max squat. But really, in terms of transference, it's not. If you improve your eight rep max, there is a high degree of transference, but it won't be a one to one ratio. You, if you increase your eight rep max by 30 pounds, you won't necessarily get 30 pounds on your one rep max. And the further and further away you get, from low reps, the more and more this becomes the case. So of course, this obviously invites the question, well, why don't we just do you know, nothing but low rep training? And the answer to that has to do with muscle hypertrophy. So before you get the wrong idea here, I'm not saying that you should quit powerlifting and become a bodybuilder because that would violate the principle of um, the said principle, right? Specific adaptations to impose demands. You have to keep squatting heavy, benching heavy, and deadlifting heavy if you want to get better at those activities. However, what I am saying is that there's only so much improvement that you can make to your technique, to your neural efficiency, to your equipment, or whatever other factors besides getting bigger. The same exact lifter using a similar training protocol, if he gains muscle, will be stronger. The, he'll have the increased size of the muscle will increase the force production he is capable of. Very simple and straightforward stuff. Now the reason why this is important is because recent exercise science has shown that the primary driver of hypertrophy in the long term is training volume. So the amount of sets, reps that you, and sets, <clears throat> basically sets and reps, right? Now this, it kind of depends on what kind of volume you're doing, right? In order to be relevant, it might need to be above 70%, or if you're doing very low percentage work, it would have to be very high RPE sets. So if you're doing sets of 30, you'd have to go close or to failure for that um, volume to really help drive hypertrophy. But that's kind of besides the point. The main thing that you need to grasp is that the primary driver of hypertrophy in the long run is volume. So one very important study that I'll be referencing constantly throughout this video and in the article that I wrote to accompany it, if you want to check that out, is a study by Brad Schoenfeld that basically compared two groups. One group was, um, they did three sets of eight, right, on a lift, and the, other, and the other group did eight sets of three. Now the volume was equated, so the weight and stuff was set up such that the tonnage, so the weight that they did times the reps times the sets was the same. So they did the same amount of training volume. And the results were that both groups had approximately the same levels of hypertrophy, but the group that did eight sets of three got significantly stronger. And if you've been paying attention to the video thus far, that's very obvious because <clears throat> their training is more specific to a one rep max. A three rep max on the specificity continuum is closer to a one rep max than doing sets of eight. 
Right? I don't necessarily know that they're doing three rep maxes, they were just doing sets of three, but the point stands nevertheless. So again, we're kind of back to square one. Everything that I'm saying might be convincing you that you want to do nothing but low rep sets. Well, there's a couple things that we need to consider first. And number one is that the group that did three sets of eight completed their training in under 20 minutes on average, where the group that did eight sets of three completed their training in well over 60 minutes. Now, the point here is that given a fixed amount of training time, you will always be able to do more volume with higher rep sets than you can do with multiple sets of low reps. Now, again, you might be asking, well, why does that matter? Because there's a limit to the amount of volume that you can do. And that is also correct. Everybody has a maximum recoverable level of volume. So even if you had 24 hours a day to train because you're an alien robot, you would still, well, maybe if you're an alien robot, this example doesn't work, but let's say you train eight hours a day, right? You, there's only so much that you can productively do. So some of you might be saying, well, okay, I don't really care how long it takes. I want to, I'll go to the gym for four hours if I have to, and I'm going to do nothing but low rep sets. Tell me why I don't do, instead of, say, eight sets of three, why don't I do 24 sets of one rep? <laughs> and it, Okay, so in order to answer that question, and it's a very good question, I'm going to back, take a step back and talk about the Bulgarian weightlifting team. Now, I've done videos and articles on this in the past. So if you want to learn more about the Bul Bulgarian weightlifting team, I'll put a link in the description box so you guys can do that. But <clears throat> the Cliff Notes version is that the, it was a tiny country, relatively speaking, that dominated the Olympics for over a decade. And what was really fascinating about them is that their athletes maxed out every single day on the squat and on the Olympic, um, the main Olympic lifts, the snatch and the clean and jerk. And they were extremely, extremely effective in doing this. However, there's one huge caveat that we have to take note of. These were professional athletes. They lived in a training hall. They had no other job, no work whatsoever. They had professional cooks, masseuses, and other staff members that took care of them. They were being coached under the watchful eye of one of the best coaches in the entire world. The athletes were hand-selected from among a huge group of very promising youth athletes, and only the very best ones made it into the program. And of course, they were using copious amounts of the highest quality pharmaceutical grade steroids and other performance enhancers. Now, if that just described your situation in life, maybe you should go do the Bulgarian method. But for most of us, that's completely unrealistic, and our training circumstances are nothing like that. And it's very, very important to note that even with these perfect ideal circumstances, the dropout and injury rate of the Bulgarian weightlifting team was enormous. Like most communist systems at the time, they used a grinder system to get their athletes. So they put in a huge amount of athletes into a funnel, and the ones that didn't get hurt and didn't quit became champions. And the vast majority of them didn't because they got hurt and they quit. So unless you want to take that risk with your own training, this is not an appropriate training style for us. Okay, so let's bring this back to the Schoenfeld study. At the conclusion of the study, they gave each group a survey and you know, asked them some basic questions like how they were feeling, if there was pain, did they enjoy the training, did they want to continue? And a quick summary would be this. The, gr the group that did three sets of eight and was finishing their training in under 20 minutes felt awesome. They wanted to continue the study. They wanted to do more and harder training. On the other hand, the group that did eight sets of three actually had participants that dropped out due to injury. They were feeling, the rest that didn't drop out were feeling on, on average burnt out. They didn't want to continue. It was very hard. They were feeling beat up. And this is the key thing that we have to know. Is sure, theoretically, like the Bulgarians showed us, you don't need exercise variation. You could grind away with nothing but very low rep sets and do a high amount of sets. But the problem with this strategy is that you're going to be exposed to high intensities all the time, which increases your injury risk. You're going to be exposed to extremely long workouts, which increases your injury risk. And overall, just the lack of variety can catch up to you in a, a, a variety of ways and result in overuse injuries, psychological burnout, and a whole host of other issues that makes the style unsustainable. So what is my point in all of this? My point is that I want you guys to realize that exercise variation is not necessary, but there are still many potential benefits. The key point that I want you to take away, though, is don't just jam a bunch of exercise variations 
into your training program because that's what everybody else does. It's extremely popular in powerlifting circles to use tons and tons of variety. But whenever you include an exercise variation, you should have a specific reason why you are doing what you are doing. And there are many potential reasons to include exercise variety besides just not getting hurt. For example, you could include variations that give you a better hypertrophy effect. So consider something like dumbbell bench where you take the handles below chest level and a longer range of motion than you could do with the barbell. There are some people that believe in attacking weak points with specific lifts. So doing something like a four, floor press or a two board press to attack a weak point in the range of motion on your bench press. Now there's also something to be said for just doing something new, something completely novel, and that might result in a better training effect because your body's not used to it, so it forces a greater degree of adaptation. There are all sorts of potential reasons to include exercise variety, but the point is, is that you should know why you're including the specific variation that you're including, and it should make sense within the context of specificity and transference. And that's the big takeaway that I want from this video. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it, found it informative, entertaining. As always, my friends, good luck for chaining and have a nice day.